I don't know about you, but I can sit and just listen to Chantel all day. Thank you, my sister, for blessing us with that beautiful song, and God has blessed you with a beautiful voice. Good morning, church. It's a beautiful day out there. It started out rain overnight, and this morning, some clouds, but it's been a glorious day. So I hope you have plans for this afternoon. Maybe go to Dew Gardens or a hiking trail. I don't know, Kaylee, don't know what we have in mind for this afternoon, but it's good to be with you. I bring you greetings from our sister church in Hillsboro, and also we had a tremendous weekend uh, last week at Nsoka Pines with elders and pastors. Uh, it was really a deeply spiritual weekend. I'm glad that one of our elders, Brother Jean-Marie, could attend with us and um, just be empowered by the Spirit, and just pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out as well. And uh, very soon we will start with a morning season of prayer that I would like to see start in our church here for maybe 9.15 every Sabbath morning. For those of you who can come at 9.15, we would like for you to be here and have a special season of prayer. I believe that we need to pray more than we do, because God is ready to finish His work, and we are part of that movement. Let us bow our heads as we pray and get into the Word this morning. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence. You have made that promise that we two or three are gathered in your name. You will be in their midst. Right now, it is our privilege to come into your presence. Open our minds. Give us receptive hearts. Give us clarity of thought. Help us to really connect with Jesus in His Word as we share the topic that you have impressed upon my heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know that we have been dealing with the flood and Noah, and I know by now I think you're ready for a new sermon series, right? Because the whole series was focused on how we can prepare and be ready for the time of the end. We started out by looking at the culture and the environment at the time of Noah, and we saw that Noah was a man who found grace in the eyes of God in the midst of all the evil around him. And then we looked at how Noah started building the ark, all the processes involved in the building of the ark. We focused on the door, the fact that the door symbolizes Jesus, the one through whom we enter. And then we looked at the flood itself. Where was God during the flood? Where was Noah? And we saw that it was not because of of the ingenuity on the part of Noah that kept that ark floating. It was the angels of heaven and God himself who protected that vessel from the storm and the ferocious wind. The whole episode of Noah's salvation can be attributed to one thing, and that is the goodness of God and His grace. And then we looked at when Noah was instructed to come out of the ark, and the rainbow of God's promise. I will talk to you soon about that. That's upcoming. But there is a concept that jumped out of our reading of Matthew 24 and also in Luke chapter 17, the two chapters that I'll be focusing on this morning, that has created a lot of controversy, a lot of questions, and a lot of, is it correct, yes or no, in the minds of people. In the late 1990s, there appeared a series called Left Behind. This was the work, a multimedia franchise at the hands of two uh, authors, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. And what they wanted to present was that as the world is heading towards its end, and the coming of Jesus is getting closer and closer. Jesus would, at some point, just before the great tribulation explodes all around the planet, Jesus would come and rapture His people away from the world. And 
LaHaye and Jenkins based their whole theory on the fact that in the Bible it says there will be two that will be in the field. One be taken, one be left. There will be two women at the mill. One be taken, one be left, which led to the concept of the left behind. Now, when you read those 16 books and you watch some of the TV programs and even some of the movies that came out, it is very clear that in their understanding, in their reasoning, the one that is left behind is the one that is lost. And the one that is taken is obviously taken by the rapture to be with Jesus. Well, we need to make sure that that is what the Bible teaches. And I will tell you why. Because if we do not get the end time events correct, it messes up everything about the judgment that God has. It messes up the concept we have of the thousand years of Revelation 20. It messes up the whole idea of the tribulation itself. And you may have friends, and I must honestly say that I have friends who believe in this, and they are very devout Christians. They are sincere people. I'm not doubting their sincerity. I'm not doubting their walk with Jesus. But I do question the theology around this Left Behind series. And I invite you to join with me on a journey this morning as we explore what the Bible says so that we cannot have any misinterpretation of this or have any wrong idea. So come with me. Let's just look at the scripture we have. And I'm going to share with you in Luke chapter 17, first of all, the conversation Jesus had, and we drop down to Luke chapter 17, because Luke chapter 17 is Luke's version of what Matthew wrote in chapter 24. I want you to look at Luke chapter 17, and we start with verse 26. Jesus is speaking. It's red letters in my word, in my Bible. And Jesus says in Luke 17, 26, as it was in days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. And then Jesus goes on to explain the lifestyle at the time of the flood. We looked into that. They ate, they drank, they married, they gave in marriage. And then the day came of the flood when Noah entered the ark. And notice very, and I don't want you to miss this. And the flood came and did what? destroyed them all. So would you agree with me that when the flood comes, in this prefiguration of what is going to happen at the end of time, if the flood is going to come at the end of time, the spiritual flood that Jesus talks about, it is not going to create a second chance for people. It's not going to tell people, well, you have more time to prepare. The day that Noah went into the ark. We know he was in the ark for seven days. The people outside were mocking. They were laughing. They were ridiculing. And after seven days, God opened the windows and of heaven, and the waters came upon the face of the earth, and the flood came and destroyed all those around the ark. The only people safe were those inside the ark. Eight people with animals and food for about a year, because the flood continued for about a year. Then Jesus goes on, Likewise as it was the days of Lot, verse 28 of Luke 17, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So twice Jesus repeats the aspect that at the second coming, it will be as the times of Noah, as the times of Lot, when the flood came, it destroyed them. When the rain of fire and brimstone rained down on Sodom from heaven, it destroyed them all. There was no second chance. But now, let's read on. Even so, will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed? In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, 
Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who's in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there be two men in one bed. Now let me clarify something here. This is not talking about a gender issue. The Greek translation for the word anthropos, which means man, is translated as anthropoi. So the correct translation should be there be two persons. Okay? So let's get that clear in the beginning. There be two persons in one bed, one be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding together, one be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. Again, you see men is in cursive, so it means two persons. One be taken, the other left. And two men will be in the field, one taken, the other left. Now the question is, where is the ones taken? And we know where the one that is left behind is going to be, either in the mole or in the field, correct? The Bible explains that. Now, in order to get to this point, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, and we will rotate between the two chapters, you just have to follow with me. Jesus was, in Matthew chapter 24, really merging two prophecies together into one. When you read Matthew chapter 24, it starts out with the disciples coming and wanting to show Jesus the temple buildings and the magnificence of the city. And Jesus kind of just blew their minds away with a statement when he said, Do you see all these buildings? Let me tell you, not one stone will be left upon another. All these buildings will be destroyed. And then the disciples said, now, Lord, when will this be? And when will be the sign of the end and the time of your coming? And then from Matthew chapter 1 through to verse 20, Jesus reveals to them what will happen with the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and the buildings of the temple. And Jesus ends that portion in Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 20 when he says, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, we always use that scripture to point out to people that long after the death of Jesus and long after the resurrection of Jesus, the Sabbath will still be kept. But Jesus concludes here, and then in verse 21, he moves on to the time when the great tribulation will come. In other words, after the fall of Jerusalem, there's another event coming. And now the events lead up to the end of time, and the coming of Jesus as the disciples asked, So Lord, when will this happen? What is the sign of your coming? So Jesus kind of merges these two prophecies together. We talk about a perspectival foreshortening in this text. Because on the one hand, Jesus explains the immediate results of what would happen to Jerusalem. And then he explains the end of time that is coming. Now, let's pause for a moment here with the first part. Regarding the fall of Jerusalem, Jesus refers them in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. He says, I want to remind you that what I'm going to tell you should not be new to you. Because if you study the word of God, if you read the scriptures, you might recall that Daniel predicted an event that will come. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in a holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand, then those who are in Judea should flee to the mountains. And then let him who is on the housetop not go down to take any of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Now, what prophecy did Jesus take this from? We have to look at the context. In Matthew chapter 24, we are just a few days literally away from Jesus being crucified. Messiah would be put to death. And we know in the book of Daniel there's a prophecy that pinpointed the time, not only of the baptism of Jesus when his anointing took place, but also his crucifixion, and also the end of the grace time for Daniel's people being the Jews. And for that we need to turn to Daniel chapter 9. So come with me to Daniel chapter 9. 
And I want you to look at a very fascinating description that Daniel received in this prophecy concerning the time when Messiah would die and what would happen after his death. And that places us right in Matthew chapter 24 in the context. Jesus was a few days shy of him being crucified and he was predicting the end of time and he kind of reminded the disciples, remember what Daniel said? So go back and study. And this is what Daniel said. We go to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. And there's a prophetic time here, but we're not going to go into that. I just want to get to the point here of what will happen after Messiah. Now, Daniel 9, 26. After 62 weeks, Messiah, or Christ, or the Redeemer, shall be cut off, but not for himself. And for the people of the prince who is to come, they shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, wait a minute. Jesus has just said... You see the buildings? They be destroyed. Not one stone will lift upon the other. When will that be? And Jesus is predicting the time that Daniel prophesied. When Messiah is cut off, which means when Jesus is crucified, after his death, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood. Interesting. Jesus, in the prophecy to Daniel in chapter 9, reveals that this army and the prince of this force that would come and destroy the city would flood into that city, proverbially, like a flood. Now we know, historically, we can pinpoint who that enemy was. The Roman armies. We know that this prophecy of Matthew chapter 24 was fulfilled 39 years later under General Titus when the Roman armies came and not only laid siege to Jerusalem, but also destroyed the city. Let me share with you a thought that is found in the book of Professor Jacques Ducan, Old Testament scholar and Hebrew scholar at, um, at Andrews University, who wrote in his book, Secrets of Daniel, Wisdom and Dreams of a Jewish Prophet in Exile. And he makes the statement, he says, A strong consensus in Jewish tradition recognizes that this prophecy, the prophecy of Daniel that says, after Messiah is cut off, the prince and the force will come and flood the city. He says, they recognize that this prophecy refers to the Romans who flooded into the city and devastated the temple, resulting in total destruction. Flavius Josephus, who apparently witnessed the event, the Talmud and the great medieval rabbis, Rabbi, Ben Ezra, etc., all agree that we should apply this prophetic vision to the siege of Jerusalem by the legions of Vespasian and finally by General Titus in 70 AD. So the Bible predicted it would happen and Jesus said this will happen. Now what's very interesting is whenever Jesus has a dualistic prophecy, there's a reason for that. Because if we can look back and we can see how the first part of the destruction of Jerusalem was fulfilled literally as Jesus predicted, then we have all the assurance that we can believe that the rest of the prophecy will also be fulfilled. So now Jesus moves into the second part. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus now goes and he says, Tribulation will come. And it's relating to the tribulation that Jesus says in verse, in Matthew chapter 24, that there be false Christs and false prophets in verse 24. They will do great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you before, and therefore if they will say to you, Look, he's in a desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner chambers, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now why would Jesus make this statement of eagles and the dead carcass? We'll come to that. And then he goes on and he explains the coming of the Lord. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Notice, 
It will be after the tribulation of those days that these things will happen. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now do not lose the context here. Jesus clearly says immediately after the tribulation of those days, which means if the tribulation is coming, then the rapture must have preceded the tribulation if we want to follow what LaHaye and Jenkins are saying in the Left Behind series. Because they claim that God's people will not go through tribulation. But Jesus says, after tribulation, the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven. But where is God's people at this point in time? Let's continue. Matthew 24, verse 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, if you read your Bible correctly, Jesus makes it very clear that tribulation will pass. God's people will be protected. They will live through the tribulation. And when tribulation is over, Jesus will come. The angels will send out. They will gather his elect for the four corners of the earth. Are you with me? So, right there, in a sense, any thought of a rapture falls flat. But let's not stop there. Now Jesus goes on and he explains deeper. He explains now in Matthew, in verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He's talking about the time of his coming, when he will send his angels out. But as the days of Noah were, so also be the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, Jesus has just explained to them a prophecy of Daniel, where Daniel predicted that a few years after Messiah's destruction or Messiah's death on the cross would be cut off, an army and a force will come like a flood and destroy the city and destroy the temple. Now, Jesus uses the same analogy of flood, but he ties it now in with Noah. And he says, as it was in the days of Noah, when there was a flood back then, there will be a flood again. But this time, a flood of destruction. Not a literal flood, because we know. Jesus said, I will never destroy this world with a flood again. And he gave the rainbow as a guarantee for that, correct? So Jesus is obviously talking about a destruction, a force of destruction that will come and destroy now, I want you to look at something very interesting. And I think this is really what nails it for us. When you look at verse 38 and 39 of Matthew, Jesus says, They did not know until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and took them all away. Now, that's very interesting. Because in verse 31, Jesus had just said, the day when the Son of Man comes, He will send His angels out. They will gather His elect from the four corners of the earth. But when the flood came, the flood will take the others away. So let me ask you this. The ones that are taken away, are they going to heaven or are they going to destruction? If the flood takes them away. Who were destroyed in the time of Noah? The people in the ark or the people who were outside that the flood took away? The flood took them away. And then Jesus goes on to explain there be two people. And it's obvious the two people represent two groups of people. Those who are ready for Jesus to come and those who are not ready for Jesus to come. Those who will, as Isaiah 25 described it, will look up and say, Behold... Here comes our Lord. We've waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in His appearing. They will not be people that will run away or try and hide. They will look up and they will see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven. And that's the hope that we have in our hearts. Amen? That through God's grace, if we don't die before that day, we can stand and look up and we can hear the trumpet sound. We can witness the graves opening. We can see our dead loved ones rise back as Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, and we can be taken to be with Jesus on the clouds. But that is not what the cloud, or rather what the flood will do. The flood will take people away, and those that are left behind are the ones that Jesus 
will come and take home to be with him. So, it's just the opposite of the way it's projected in a left behind series. In left behind, they want you to think that Jesus is the one who's like the flood taking them away. No. In the time of Daniel, the enemy of God's people came and destroyed the city like a flood. At the end of time, the enemy will again come like a flood and destroy the people. Let's pause for a moment and look at what's the concept of flood in the Bible. If you want to come with me to Revelation chapter 12, come with me to Revelation chapter 12. Let's try and analyze what the understanding of flood is. We know that Jesus talked about the spiritual flood. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12 and we look at verse 13. Now, when you study Revelation 12, and by the way, we have been studying Revelation now thanks to author Mark Finney for our Sabbath school lesson. So you should know at least the basics of Revelation 12. Revelation 12 describes the war between Christ and Satan that started in heaven. It, it describes a time when Jesus came, he was on earth, the dragon was ready to devour him, and the woman was crying out in her pains, the woman representing God's people, and Jesus was born, and then Jesus was taken away to the father, and the mother or the woman was left behind. Now, Revelation 12 verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Why? Because he can no longer touch the male child. Jesus has been now ascended. He's with the Father. He's defeated the enemy. That's why Satan has been cast down. But now the devil focuses his attention on who? He goes after the woman. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, which is nourished for the prophetic time of time, times, and half a time. But now I want you to come to verse 15 with me, because this is what I want to get to. So the serpent, now who's the serpent? The dragon, Satan, the devil. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood to do what? That he might cause the woman to be carried away with a flood. So any time the Bible mentions a flood or an experience of a flood, it talks about the enemy of God's people. And that is why in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 17, you cannot equate the flood with Jesus taking people away. The flood is the work of the devil. It is the enemy of God who will take his people and take them to destruction. That is why it's important to look at the context here. Now it's very interesting that Jesus, in the Old Testament book of Zephaniah, it's about the fourth last book of the Old Testament. If you want to turn me to Zephaniah chapter 1. It's interesting that Zephaniah talks about how God will deal with the week at the day when he comes. If you go to, just from the book of Habakkuk, we come to Zephaniah chapter 1. In chapter 1 of Zephaniah, the prophet is shown the great day of the Lord. And God says in Zephaniah 1 verse 2, I will utterly consume everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. And then drop down to verse 7. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has appeared, has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. And it shall be that in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all that are clothed with foreign apparel. And you can read on about this. So there's very interesting connections here with the concept of what Jesus is sharing in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 17. Remember in Matthew we read, they were drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and eating when the time of Noah was there until the flood came and the flood 
took them away. We saw that. Now, in Zephaniah 1 verse 2, God says, I will utterly consume everything. What's interesting is the Hebrew use of the word there, I will utterly consume everything, is translated in the Latin as rapture, from which we get the word rapture. So Jesus says in this verse, in the Latin Bible, I will rapture everything from the face of the land, I will consume man and beast. It doesn't sound like a rapture that leads to salvation, it sounds like a rapture that leads to destruction. Because the Hebrew word suf, that's translated here in this verse, for God that says, I will consume everything, I will scrape the land clean from all the, all the evil. The Hebrew word is the word suf, which is translated as to snatch away, to terminate, to destroy, and to cause to perish. To me, that doesn't sound like God saving you from the time of tribulation. And Jesus is referring to the very same thing in Luke chapter 17. So let's go to Luke chapter 17 now. And look at what are some of the Greek terminology that can help us to decipher this concept. We've already seen in the, in the context of the verse that the flood would come and take people away. Two men will be in the field, two women at the mill, one taken by the flood. One left behind. Two women at the mill, one taken by the flood, one left behind. What does that word taken mean? The word taken comes from a Greek paralambano. If you use it in a passive voice, it means to arrest or to place under arrest or to lock up. So, if you have to read it in the Greek, it says, and the flood came and took them all captive and arrested them for destruction. That's what the Greek word says. It ties in with the Hebrew word suf in Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 2. So with that being said, now we know that if the Greek terminology agrees with the text, that the flood will come and the flood will apprehend or capture or take them. In the times... Of the flood, when Noah was in the ark with his seven family members, we know outside was chaos. When the rain started falling and the flood was coming down and the waters of the deep opened up and it was chaos, the people outside were desperate. They were knocking on the ark, they were trying to get in. They tied their children and their families to trees, hoping that they would stay afloat. But then the rock boulders came crashing down on them. They even went so far as they, they, they tied themselves to animals, thinking if these animals could swim, they will survive. You can read all about this in the book Patriots and Prophets. It gives a beautiful description of the time of the flood. That's how desperate people were. But the flood came and arrested them. And that what it simply means, there's no way of escape out of it. When the flood comes and takes you away, there's no escape. That's a context that God wants us to have in His Word. But it doesn't end there. The disciples are standing, listening, in awe to the words of Jesus. And now they ask a question in Luke chapter 17, verse 37. They answered and said to Him, where, Lord? Where? Now, Jesus has just told them, two men will be in the field, one taken, one left. Two women will be grinding together, one taken, one left. So now they want to know where or where to, Lord. Now, if you were a disciple... And you were to ask that question, what was the answer you expected to hear? Would you want to know where the people were left behind? Or would you want to know where they are taken? Jesus has just explained to them, the men will be in the field, the women will be at the mall. So Jesus gave a location. There's no need for him to say, oh, you know where they'll be left? I told you, in the field and at the mill. 
is logical. The question they wanted to know is, where is the flood taking them? And notice what Jesus says. Wherever the body is, now in Matthew's translation, Jesus refers to the word carcass, which means a body that's, that's decomposing. Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now, Jesus uses here a text that comes right out of the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. In the Jewish mind, and remember, these disciples were all Jews, Jesus referred them to a chapter in Deuteronomy. If you come with me in your Bible, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 26. And in the mind of the Jew, this was the utter place of destruction. God says in verse 26 of Deuteronomy 28, Your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. And the Lord will strike you with the balls of Egypt, with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch, from which you cannot be healed. So God says, the place where the flood will take them is the place of destruction. That's why the eagles will gather there. Now people say, but wait a minute, an eagle is not the kind of bird that fits with the description. But the Greek word aetos can be interpreted as either eagle or vulture. It depends on the context. Now, what's very interesting is this is not the only place in the Old Testament where we read about this destruction or the final culmination of the wicked, where they will end up. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 32. If you come with me to Ezekiel, chapter 32, and we look at verse 4 to verse 6. Ezekiel 32, verse 4 to verse 6. God says, then I will leave you on the land. I will cast you out on the open fields and cause to settle on you all the birds of the heavens. And with you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your carcass. I will also water land with the flow of your blood. Even to the mountains and the river beds will be full of you. When I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. So God is talking about destruction. Ezekiel repeats the same thought, and you can read it in chapter 39, verse 17 to 20. But what is amazing, when John was on the Isle of Patmos and he was looking down the corridor of prophetic timeline, the vision that appeared to him about the end of the wicked comes through very clear, and it corresponds exactly what Jesus says in the closing argument of Luke, where the dead carcass or the body is there, the vultures or the eagles will gather. Come with me to Revelation 19, because Revelation 19 talks about where the wicked will end up, and we come to Revelation chapter 19, and we look at verse 17. Are you with me? Revelation 19, verse 17, and John is in vision, and John says, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army, but the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received those, uh, the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire and brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeds from the mouth of him who sat on the throne, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. This is not the literal that the birds will one day come and eat on the carcass of the dead. All God is saying is this is the ultimate place of destiny for those the day when Jesus comes who are not ready to receive him. 
Because God's people will look up and they will exclaim, this is our Lord for whom we have waited. Jesus adds another reinforcement of this in the last part of Matthew 24. And you can actually come to Matthew 24 verse 43 now. And Jesus says, watch therefore, in verse 42, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known that what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus ties his coming to the appearance of a thief in the night. I don't know how many of you have ever had a burglary in your house. Back in South Africa, I had experience. We were sleeping one night, and about 4 o'clock in the morning, the light of our bedroom went on, and we were asleep, and my wife and I tried to open our eyes, and, and we tried to focus, and there, at the foot end of the bed, were two police constables standing. And he gently touched my toe. He said, Sir! You better wake up. The thieves are carrying all your stuff out of your house and you're asleep. My wife was still trying to wake up. She said, ah, go away. I'm tired. And she says, we are serious. Well, we got up. Come to realize that while we were sleeping, they came in through the study door, found the keys in the kitchen, unlocked the door. They were carrying everything out. And our neighbor just so happened to have a bad night. And he looked out his bedroom window onto the road. You could see that there are people carrying a television set and others carrying stuff. And he thought, wait a minute. And he looked and he thought, well, it must be the neighbor. So he called the police. And that's how the police came out. So my neighbor was watching and I was sleeping. Now the thief did not surprise him. But the thief surprised me. And that's a context Jesus wants us to have. He says, I will come as a thief in the night, therefore be ye ready. Be ye ready so that you can stand and look up and see the Lord coming in the clouds of heaven. Paul makes the statement in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4, Paul says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Why is Jesus giving us all this metaphors, talking about the flood, talking about Noah, talking about Lot? Because here's the thing. In the time of Noah, in the time of Lot, no one thought a flood would come. No one thought Sodom would be destroyed. It got them all with surprising unexpectancy. God wants us to be ready. Don't wait for the political scene in America to change before you start getting ready. Don't wait for United Nations to say things to get ready. Don't wait for the Vatican to start moving in the religious field of the world, say it's better time to prepare. No. If you are not ready now, if I'm not ready now, what would it take for us to be ready? And that's why Jesus says, I want you to know that There's no second chance. I'm going to share with you the greatest concern I have with any idea of a rapture of the church. With all respect to Tim LaHaye and J.D. Jenkins, is the idea that when God comes and raptures His church, there is a period of seven years and you have a second chance to get ready before Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven. The Bible doesn't talk about a second chance. The Bible says, the day the Son of Man comes, it will be like the flood that came and destroyed them all. It will be like the fire that rained on Sodom and destroyed them all. The devil would like for us to think, ah, I have a chance. Okay, Jesus, you've wrapped at the church. Boy, I better wake up and get ready. My friends, with all urges in my heart, I want to say to you, that will be too late. 
Because when you study Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 17 carefully, you'll be surprised to understand that the one taken is the one that will go to perdition and be lost. And the one that will be waiting, looking up, exclaiming, this is our Lord, is the one whom Jesus will come and take home to be with him. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that you prepare us as your people. Lord, your word is amazing. We need not be in darkness. We need not be brainwashed by some theories that are floating out there in the religious world. Help us to be the kind of people that will take your word and take it and exclaim that I want this word to be my compass, to be my guide, to be the lamp for my feet, the light for my path, so that I can always ask the Holy Spirit for me to hear a clear, thus saith the Lord. Lord, we live in a time where people are building their religious experience on the thoughts and processes of authors and theologians and others. Help us to stand on a solid rock. You shared a parable in Matthew chapter 7 when you said, Not everyone who says to you, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do your will. For many will come that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not in your name prophesied? Have we not in your name performed miracles, cast out demons? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. You who work iniquity. And then you explained, it's like two men building a house. One who built his house on the rock, the other who built his house on the sand. And when the flood came, the flood took away the house built on sand. But the house built on the rock could stand. Help us to stand on the rock, Jesus Christ. Keep us ready. Help us to be prepared. Because we know you are coming soon. And we pray for our loved ones. We pray for our families, our children, our grandchildren. We pray for our colleagues and friends, Lord. I pray that you will just create in our hearts an urgency to tell others to get ready because Jesus is coming soon. And we pray in his name. Amen. Chantel, will you please come and lead us with your beautiful voice? Our closing song will be on the screen. We're only going to sing the first, the third, and the last stanza of 598. Watch ye saints. That's what Jesus asked us to do. So only the first, the third, and the last stanza.